call or, or had a discussion with somebody or heard a news report that, that, challenged, that, that mocked or ridiculed something you loved. You know, maybe it was your, your political view, your favorite sports teams. You know, I hate it when they mock the Tigers or the Lions, which is more often what happens. You know, or, or maybe it's your, your career or, or, you know, maybe it's, it's the country. Maybe when you hear people mocking the United States, you know, it's, it's upsetting because it's something you hold dear. It's something you value. And, and that can feel really personal. Part of that is because that, that's part of who we are. When we ask the question, who what, am I? These things that, that we accept or, or understand ourselves through define who we are. So we start to see ourselves through our favorite team, through our, our political views, through our, our nationality, through our ethnicity. That's start, part of how we define ourselves. And so when people attack those kinds of things or mock it, it can feel really personal because that's how we understand ourselves and that's how we understand the world. You see, about a week and a half ago, a friend of mine posted something on Facebook and usually I'm pretty good about not responding to things or, or not reacting, but I guess on that day I wasn't having a particularly good day. And so he posted a quote by Salman Rushdie and and he's not always the nicest person or the most tactful person. This quote, it kind of, it, it mocked belief in any religion. It said that that was uh, living in the dark ages. Only idiots believe in, in God. Only idiots would, would have faith in something. And, and, you know, usually I can let that slide because you have people that are closed-minded and, and they want to get you to react. But at the end of his quote, he had this statement that really bothered me. It said that we should, among other things, have a fearless disrespect for religion. And that means that you should have a fearless disrespect for something I hold dear, something that I value. And you see, that felt pretty personal to me. That felt like that was an attack on, on who I was. And, and normally I'm good about not reacting because I know that reacting doesn't get me anywhere. And, and posting on the internet is probably the worst thing you can do. But... You know, I guess I was having one of those days. And my friend is usually better than that. Usually he has a little more tact and, and patience and respect for other people's views. But I guess he must have been having one of those days too. And so, you know, that's what happens. And so as this, as this began to happen, as this began to play out, I decided I was going to type out a response. And, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty smart guy. So I had, I had some pretty good things to say. And, and I start to, to respond. Well, you think atheism promotes freedom of speech and freedom of thought? Atheism is the most closed-minded of them all. You know, yeah, it, it says that, but if you disagree, then you're an idiot. You're in the dark ages. Your, vi your opinion doesn't matter. You know, and, and you think atheism isn't a faith? Sure it is. It, it, you might not call it a religion. You believe in yourself or you believe in mankind or you believe in naturalism in some other way, shape, or form. You know, the only religion that gives freedom of thought and freedom of expression is Christianity. It says to turn the other cheek. It says to love your enemy or to, to you know, have compassion on other people. And then, you know, as I'm, as I'm going on, you can imagine it's not quite in the tone I'm speaking now. It's a little bit more resentment and disdain in my voice. And then I, you know, okay. Well, you know, it's getting towards Martin Luther King Jr. Day and everybody respects him. I'll, I'll throw in one of his quotes. You know, hate only gets more hate. The only way to overcome hate is with love, as I'm typing with a little bit of anger in my voice. So <laughs> clearly not heeding my own words or, or listening to the preparation I've done for this very sermon. Apparently I wasn't, I wasn't there, but I figured, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. So I, I keep on going. You know, you, you seem to blame religion for all the atrocities around the world, but you do realize that the worst genocides in human history were, were done by atheists. Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, Mussolini, I can keep on going all day if you want. You know, I, I'm really rolling now. And then, post. All right. I'm feeling pretty good now. I've, 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 I've voiced my opinion. And then, you know, an hour or two passed. And I started to think, oh, man, maybe that wasn't the best way of doing things. Usually, usually I'm smarter than this, but didn't really do what I wanted to do. You know, I'd, I'd acted out of my, I didn't respond in love. I, I acted out of my insecurity. I, I acted out of sin. You see, I heard what the guy had said and, and it bothered me. And so I acted in fear. I acted in anger in response to their statement. Because you see, when people ask me, who is Matthew Sheeman? My first response would be, I'm a, I'm a disciple of Jesus. I'm a follower of Christ. I am a Christian. But when I react like that, people that, that hear that answer from me, 
That's not a very good representation of Christianity. You know, I'm, I'm reacting, I'm, I'm giving a poor view, I'm giving, a, I'm giving a poor example of how to love my enemy or love somebody who, who has a different opinion than I do. And so, you know, I, just, I, I decided I was going to humble myself and I went back and I wrote an apology. I posted underneath my other post and I said, you know, I'm sorry, you know, that, that the last part of your comment felt really personal. I felt like it attacked me. I, I need to ask for your forgiveness. And, and my friend responded and said, no, don't worry about it. But one of the other people responded and said, absolutely not. You know, and, and we'll get into that. We'll get into that, that, that part of the story in a minute. But, you know, it, it's, it's part of the reality we live in. And, and unfortunately, I can't, in, in my day-to-day -day life, I can't always live like Taylor Swift and just shake it off. You know, sometimes when the haters hate, it does get to me. I can't just let it go. But, you know, as we get to the gospel, we, we see how Jesus reacts to the same thing that I was going through and the same thing you guys go through on your day-to-day -day lives. You see, Jesus had to deal with the haters, with the Pharisees who said, you're a liar, your testimony isn't true. The, the Jews who said, you're demon-possessed, you're a Samaritan, that's how you're doing these things. And you know, at least they had their options right. As C.S. Lewis put it, Jesus can only be one of three things. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or his Lord. If he's a liar, he is hands down the worst person in human history because he knowingly led people astray to believe he was the savior of the world and the son of God. I mean, if he's a lunatic, then, well, I mean, there, there are plenty of people that are in insane asylums who have thought they were God. It doesn't mean that it's true. Maybe, maybe he thought he was God, but that doesn't necessarily make it a true statement. Or he is who he said he was. He truly is the son of God. And, and you know, his, his preaching, his actions, his baptism, his tr uh, transfiguration, you know, the, his life, death, and resurrection, everything points to somebody who's mentally stable, driven, focused, on task, who doesn't react to things, but simply responds and follows God's will. And, and so as we hear the story of Jesus in, in this gospel message, it gives us a lot of things to think about, about how we react in our day-to-day -day lives. You see, when the Pharisees lash out at him and say, you're a liar, your testimony isn't true, you're testifying about yourself, Jesus doesn't react, he simply responds. I know where I came from. I know, I know where I'm going. I know who my father is. My testimony is true. He testifies about me. If you knew God, you'd know who I am. And you know, if he was a liar, when they, were, when they attacked him, he would have reacted. He would have changed his statement. He would have attacked them back. He would have done something different. But all Jesus does is go back to his core identity. He goes back to what God the Father had declared about him at his baptism. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Jesus went back to that truth. He rested in that truth. So you see, when, when they come at him, all he does is invite them into that truth. He says, just listen to my words. Know who I am. And that will give you peace. That will give you life. You know, that, that will give light into your life. And then we get to the second scene later in the gospel, and, and I'd invite you to read the whole, the whole chapter 8, because it's, it's one attack after another, but at the end, the, the Jews who started to believe in him, he's talking to them and revealing more and more about who he is. And then he, they, they re react and say, man, you're, you're demon-possessed, you're a lunatic, you are out of your mind, you're off the rails if you're saying things like that about yourself. This guy has, has lost it. Maybe some of his other stuff was challenging, but this is just no way. No way, no how. And again, Jesus doesn't react, he simply responds. I'm only doing what the Father has shown me. I'm doing what the Father has told me. I know him and I do what he does. If you knew him, you would recognize who I am. You would recognize my identity. You would follow me and it would set you free. It would, it would, you would hear the message of love, the message of truth, of hope, and it would free your lives. It would transform your hearts and your minds by the, the good news that God is here and he is for you. You see, Jesus, he returns time after time to that identity proclaimed at his baptism. And, and Jesus goes back to, he centers himself on, on what he loves. And that's where he finds his identity and his meaning. And what Jesus loves is his father. Jesus goes back to that love over and over again. And you know, that, that's all well and good. But it's, as you and I are here, it goes, okay, well, great, but... I don't always hear those words, and I don't always go back to that love, even if it is there for me. I mean, certainly, I didn't go back to that love when I reacted in that statement. I reacted out of my own insecurity, out of my fear, out of my, out of my brokenness. But you see, God can work even through that. God, I, I truly believe that, that as I ask for forgiveness from God and from, from my friends, 
for that statement, that God was going to work through that. He was, he was going to work through my faults, through my brokenness, because he is such a gracious and loving God. And, and that, that guy who responded and said, absolutely not, I will not forgive you. I decided after that I would respond instead of reacting. And it led to a conversation that, that talked, where we talked about faith, about love, about life, about God, about hope. And, and, you know, it's not always that evident how God is working through our faults. But luckily he blessed me this, this past week to see it that way. But, you know, no matter, no matter what happens, we can always go back to God. He, he is always giving us hope. He's always bringing us and drawing us more fully into Christ to, to live and dwell and find our identity in him. You see, when we remember that God is our father, it gives us security. And, and, and there's no doubt about it. You'll face days coming up in the day-to-day where, where even though you want to react in the right way, where you want to respond instead of reacting, what a family member, what a friend, what a coworker, what a news report says will cause you to react because we all get insecure about who we are once in a while. We all get insecure because we can't always rest the way we should in what God the Father has spoken about us. But yet God is still faithful and good. He is loving. You see, when, when we fail in that temptation, God says, don't worry about it. Your identity is still set in that, that day you were baptized and I spoke these words to you. You know, God, that, that you are my beloved child. God says to you every time, you are my child whom I love. With you I am well pleased, even after you fail in temptation. And when you succeed, when temptation or when those reactions come and you respond and said, God says, great, you've embraced that identity. You're my beloved child whom I love. With you I am well pleased. It's the same thing no matter what. Our identity is secure. You see, we belong to a king whose kingdom is secure and it's unshakable. Jesus is now the king of kings. That's his identity. He is the son of God, truly. And that means that when we put on Christ, when we dwell in him, that cannot be taken from us. No matter what anybody says, no matter what comes in this life, no matter what, what happens, who we are is secure in Christ. When we feel insecure, we can always go back to the Father and remember his words. So I want to leave those words with you as, as the closing for this. You are God's beloved child, whom he loves and with whom he is well pleased. Amen. Please stand as we continue to confess.